Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're just going to wait a moment or two as folks arrive in today's session before we begin. So make yourselves at home. We have a really exciting discussion ahead and we're delighted that you have joined us today. All right, since we have such a rich and wonderful cohort of panelists today and a lot of discussion to be had, I'll just jump right in. Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for this panel presented by Folk Alliance International. My name is Tressa Levasseur. My pronouns are she and her. And in terms of a visual description, I am a white woman with purple earrings and long, somewhat thinning, curly brown hair. And I'm in a room with lots of curtains and a couch behind me. No cat, although cats may make an appearance later in today's webinar. As we begin, let us take a moment to take a deep breath all together. And in taking this breath, let's acknowledge that we're all breathing the air of a very particular place on this planet that we all inhabit. And that the places where we live, each of us, have complex and long histories of folks who have lived there for thousands of years, folks who have come there to settle or come there against their will. And that this is a moment for us to together acknowledge the complexities uh, of doing any kind of land acknowledgement in the context of a digital gathering, in particular a global one, but that we have a shared responsibility in the same way that we all breathe air of a particular place, but an air that is shared by our whole planet to make good of this short time we each have on this spinning sphere and to consider very deeply our roles and our responsibilities in the work of active accompliceship and decolonization and reconciliation. So I invite you all to use a tool which I will drop in the chat after I finish talking um, and share an acknowledgement of where it is that you're joining us from on this planet. I myself am here on what I recently learned is Treaty 3 territory, the Between the Lakes Agreement of 1793 on the territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe and Adirondack people in what is colonially known as Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. We hope that you'll share your thoughts and observations in the chat box today. We have questions. Panelists will be asking other panelists questions today. So we're not taking many questions today, but you're welcome to drop them in the chat regardless. Um, if you want to watch this again, or share it with a friend. This panel, along with all of our other webinars, are available for free on our YouTube channel. You can just Google Folk Alliance YouTube, there it will be. And we are delighted to have a number of fabulous panelists joining us today, literally from around the world, from Australia to the UK to Canada. Um, all of our panelists have agreed to bring their authentic selves to what promises to be a rich and nuanced discussion of the issues facing various key players in the live touring ecology. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce the introducer of these panels, um, my pal, Glenn Dickey from Sounds Australia. Hi, Glenn, how are you today? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, wherever you might be. Uh, Welcome. This is kind of uh, an, a slightly new format that uh, we're going to be attempting today. Um, my name is Glenn Dickey, also known as Glenny G. I'm the export music producer for Sounds Australia. I am here on Gadigal land in Australia, and I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present and pay my respects to any Indigenous folks who might be joining us from uh, all over the world today. Um, Brief description, white, uh, middle-aged man, middle-aged-ish. Uh, I am wearing my, uh, well, you, you can only see the top of me, but I'm wearing a white T-shirt with a denim shirt and a black jacket over the top. I'm in my home office, and at any time, a ginger cat will appear like that in the background. Um, that's ninja, just for reference. No, so today... Um, we will be, uh, it's more, it's almost like a slightly like a d debate um, system where the, we'll be asking a, a certain question 
from a certain um, sector of the uh, music ecosystem and then having an open discussion about how uh, we might be able to make make it better and we're not we're not going to answer any necessary answer any questions and we'll probably end up with more questions than uh, than we started with and that's okay and this is part one of a two-part kind of session in this um today I, i'm not going to go through deep a deep dive into the um uh, deep dive into the bios of everybody today just quick introduction so we can get straight into it but the uh, a bio will be put into the chat so you can um, have a look at everybody. So representing the artist today, we've got Lady Nade, who's uh, currently in London. Uh, we've got Mama Kin, who is in Perth. Uh, no, she's in Margaret River at the moment in uh, Western Australia. Uh, very early for, for, for Mama Kin uh, at the moment. The managers, representing the managers, we've got David Click Cox, who I'll be referring to as Click. Uh, the agent is Tao Ming Lao, uh, who is currently in uh, Vancouver, or is, but is normally residing in Toronto, as does Click. Uh, representing the festivals, Mark Monaghan, who is in Ottawa, and Liz Scott, who is in Meaford in Canada. Um, at any time, somebody, I often tend to speak quite quickly in these things. So if you didn't understand that, I do apologize. I just want to get straight into the conversation. Okay, so we will be, and I need to refer to some notes here, right? Give me one second, okay? So the conversation today is going to center around each different point of view or perspective, bringing an issue to the table, something that they've Zev, our panelists, um, something they've been wrestling with about the ecology within the music system, system I guess, and uh, see what the group has to offer by way of insight and advice. Um, the questions will be asked by the different sectors and then the uh, answers will come from the rest of the group. Um, but we will allow, allow the uh, person answering the question to give context around the question as well. So, Let's start with question one here. Uh, and the f question one is starting, we're starting at the festival, the festivals, um, which will be represented by Liz and Mark. Um, now, Liz, are you going to take the reins on, on figuring out which of these two questions that were predetermined you're going to ask here? Sure, I can do that if Mark's all right with the, the fees one. Um, and the question, the question is, is about artist fees um, sometimes. And is for some artists, it feels like the fees have gone up um, quite a lot, in the, especially since in the last few years. And then of course, especially as, as COVID has hit. And um, we're, I guess our, our, our thought is we have increased costs as well. Um, and, our goal of course is to provide the best musical experience that we can for our audience and stay within budget and carry the torch and pass this along for, uh, for future generations. So I guess our, our, I think our question from this is with all the increased costs, especially with, with COVID and insurance coming up, um, how are we going to all work together so that we can maintain our festivals and be sustainable moving into the future and still um, provide the best experience for our artists and for the audience as well. Mark, did you want to add to anything to that before we go to the... Um, I, I guess what I'd like to add, and Liz, I think you stated it well, is that, you know, I also like the, the notion of why uh, how does festivals determine the price they pay for artists and how do the agents determine the price they ask us to pay? And that is kind of a tricky question because many of us in Canada are not for profit, um, uh, corporations. So, um, we're not in to make a profit. So we're very unique in the sense that if live nation makes an offer for an artist, uh, they're presenting a very simple proposition which is, this is what it's costing to rent the hall. This is what it's costing for marketing. And this is what, you know, is left over or, or this is the mechanics of, of how it works. In the festival world, I feel we have a story to tell. And the story is about why we're doing this, which is not just about money. 
Um, and I think that is really the key to negotiating, uh, you know, for certain artists that you really want to have appear at the event. And it's important to, to communicate that story. Not everybody's going to be understanding of it, but I think we need to develop our own narrative in order to present the best programming we can. Okay, can I throw this one first to uh, Click? I'm going to I'm going to go straight to management and who's in the middle of all of this and get your perspective. Um, I actually believe transparency is key, but unfortunately. I hate to say this, but I've also dealt with scenarios where um, agents sometimes don't want the transparency to happen either. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, they want to be the person doing all the shot calling and negotiating and everything. But I kind of like, you know, a promoter and, and, and being involved in the conversation and seeing everything that's going on. I don't, I don't need to take control of the reins in terms of negotiation, but at least, you know, making sure that there's some transparency of knowing exactly what, why we're offering, why we're asking for what we're asking for. You know what I mean? Um, and I also think it's great, you know, what Mark, what you're talking about, like there is definitely a different, a different system from like doing your own show or doing a show with a promoter versus doing something with a festival. And I think it's great when you actually have a festival that can kind of explain to you what their event is about. You know, like sometimes I've show up at a festival, I'm like, oh, I didn't even know that they did all these other things. Like that was never communicated to us or like, you know, some charitable events or different things that they wanted to have us involved in. It never really was brought to our attention until we landed on site. So I, I think transparency would really change that mindset a little bit. Um, it also depends on who the manager is sometimes. <laughs> You know, they might just be chasing the money. And so it is what it is, unfortunately. I'm going to throw, I'm going to now throw to uh, Tao and get the, the agent perspective on this, on, you know, with two key words that have already come up as transparency and communication. So how, um, as the person negotiating and usually the person who's in the, having the most communication with the festival um, bookers, what's your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, our agency, Blue Crane, likes to take a really sort of hands-on approach um, to shows that, you know, to uh, clicks sort of requests and preferences of knowing more about the festival, knowing who the sponsors are, knowing who, you know, what partners that might be present um, in connection to festivals, what what stages they might be doing for youth, what stages they might be doing, um, you know, during the day, um, all that stuff, you know, we try to communicate, we try to include links on, on an event um, to our management teams um, so they can kind of do their own research and check out cool things that, you know, an event might be doing, especially in now's age where, um, everyone's thinking of multi-event package um, events and festivals like the we're looking to past non-traditional or past traditional formats of how do we connect audiences um, from the pandemic so you know venues are now outfitted many venues across the country are now outfitted with new sound systems and um, you know um, access the new club in Toronto um, which took over mod club you know they have full-on um, uh, high definition video walls now installed in the venues um, to do interesting live stream stuff. So um, our venues and our event, the whole landscape is completely different in terms of how people want to package and, and market events. I think, you know, I totally agree with Click in terms of transparency. And, you know, my question of this panel is radius clauses, which I'll get into later. But that key for me is, is transparency. We got to communicate, hey, how are we going to market these events together? How do we get artists on the road? so they can play the most amount in a four month period, in a six month period. Um, I'm gonna go into that further, but I think transparency is key. And I think that agents have to start working with promoters in a really um, pound the pavement type of way as we get our economy back um, in terms of how do we market this? How, what radiuses are we gonna decide on and agree with, with our promoters? How do we um, connect with our promoters in a more intimate way 
to be like, Hey, we've got this show going on for the artist. We're going to finish to wrap that up in a week. Then we're going to go out with your event and we're going to market it in this way. Um, so I think we have to be a bit more creative and transparent and, um, I'll speak more on that later. Well, every, everything's got to be, everything's different now. Cause you could start something, you could have a 14 week tour and that could just get canceled at any, at any time. So, you know, you're talking, we're, we're talking about the difference between festivals who are not for profit festivals that are for profit. How do you, and you've got, you know, agents have been like, you've had a really rough time during COVID because, you know, you, where is your agency fee? You've got to look after your interests for your business and yourself and get your fees and stuff like that. So the transparency that I'm curious about is how, how do you now negotiate to make sure that you're earning a living when the festival fees are going to be potentially lower and there's got to be compromise with the artists as, as well? Like how does how does how do you talk money now? Um a lot of money talks are actually through being through promoters being more gentle with radiuses, I find, which has been my experience in the last couple months of booking, trying to get this country back in, in economy is like, you know, generally for like the major festivals across the country, I've previously experienced, you know, uh, two to four month post show radiuses that have been in place. Um, right now, it's like a month. So that's four weeks that, you know, my artist just rides out and, and can play again. Um, so I think being gentler with that is it has been really helpful. Um, I think the agency landscape, we've had a horrid year. Um, but what a great benefit, I think, um, coming out of the pandemic from the agency side is there's a lot more agencies. There's a lot more indies. There's a lot of people, you know, with the shakeup of you know, paradigm having to to lay off 200 staff. It's like people have have left and people have partnered with new agents. people have new colleagues people are trying there's more agencies ever um and Everyone, everyone's trying ever, to get the new market which is really cool like it's it's more it's more um reminiscent of what we see in agencies in europe especially in the electronic music space which is you know um a space i work in as well is that the proliferation of indies is awesome and Canada really benefits from that because we've we're an extremely concentrated industry traditionally with only four or five agencies from coast to coast to coast um but you see you know Canada always takes lead on states in a lot of ways there's so many indies in the states now so you kind of have to check everyone's email address where is everyone now everyone's in a different place and I think um you know in terms of the money it's like the money, the money can be less. Um, I, I wouldn't say that's a general, um, uh, a general catch all. I think, um, I think maybe until the end of the year, I think 2022 is going to look different. 2023 is going to look different. Um, but right now everyone's desperate just to get events on the go. So, you know, um, artists will confirm at, um, because they're desperate to, to play. And, you know, I don't think you could say one on the one hand, they're being taken advantage of, but I don't actually fully believe that. I think that there is just this sort of communal spirit of like, how do we, let's just focus on getting the events back. And yep. in, in the next 12 months to 24 months, we, we can reshape fees as, as they, they come about, but that in Canada, that depends a lot on granting budgets and things like that. And how, yeah. And I guess we're, we're talking, like that we're also talking on a we've got to keep perspective on somehow on a global level as as well i, I mean most of the people are probably joining from north america um i'm conscious that we will need to move to the next question in a second but i do just quickly um mama king can i just get a, qu a quick um perspective from you on on what you've heard so far uh yeah um so i think if anything that this last 18 months has taught us is that we are genuinely all in this together and um we sort of we can rise and fall together um and i think this is an opportunity for a massive paradigm shift and transparency can sit at the center of that um, i think there's an opportunity right now for some real transparency and aligned wealth um you know the artist is, is always at the center of these events they that these events occur because of the artists and, the, and artists get to play because of the events. And I think opening up a real dialogue between artists, agents, managers and events around what it takes collectively to put on a show and what the other streams of income are or what the potentials are, 
Um, I know as an artist myself, I'm more interested in a long game of something working um, than I am in the short, you know, the short impact of having a bumper fee for this one show. When I'm allowed to show, okay, what this is what it's taking me to deliver this show. This is the show I want to deliver. This is what it's taking me to deliver this show. When I'm able to enter into that kind of discourse with my management, with my booking agent, and that is then taken to a festival and vice versa, I just think there's a great opportunity at the moment for it to look different. And if we can get some great minds across this who are willing to take the risk of being genuinely transparent about what it takes for us to co-deliver these events and that the artists can bear some of that, you know, I think there's a lot of attitude out there around always trying to protect the artists from the reality of things. And I think that's actually made um, the artist reality a little bit smaller than it needs to be or um, less invested than it can be. So in a snapshot, I'm trying to get across a million ideas that I have bottlenecking yeah. and be aware of time. That's all I'm going to say at this point. <laughs> oh, yeah. I want to say so much. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's, I feel like I'm just like I'm sprinting. I've been watching the Olympics. Yeah. And just like, you just <laughs> like, like, got to get as much done as possible. Um, totally. Just, just a reminder, everybody, just if you've got comments, questions, queries, concerns, put them in the chat and we can save the chat later. It's all about just getting the... Um, yeah, getting the conversation started. So get that get that chat happening. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, to click, um, and uh, and your question, please. So my question was more around um, how do you address systemic discrimination um, when it comes to artists and trying to get them booked, um, or even trying to find an agent for that matter. Um, and not just from a, a racial discrimination side of things, but also from um, sometimes like a classism type of thing as well. I'll show a couple of examples just to show you what I'm dealing with. One, getting booked on a festival with an artist, driving almost 17 hours to go to that festival, to show up at the festival and the festival literally maybe an hour and a half before needing to jump on stage. And, and the time slot being moved on us, telling us we need to go on now because one of their artists, um, the bigger name act that was supposed to be on, couldn't make it for that for their slot. And they were trying to shift things around. And I said, well, you know, my act is not an act that can just jump on stage and start right away. <laughs> it's a band, do you know what I mean? There's a lot of moving pieces. And so, um, they said, well, I said, it's going to take at least an hour for us to get into motion and we're an hour away from our slot. So what's the difference? You know, no, I need you on in 15 minutes or you're not going on at all. That was the response. And um, that to me, it was very disrespectful, um, especially with the festival. I actually, I'd done many shows with them before and I, I now I don't want to do any shows with them and I don't want to recommend them to anybody because of the way they treated us, you know. Um, and then the other angle is, you know, working with an artist, specifically, I have an artist named Sate, who has won actually uh, an award at the Ottawa Blues Fest in the past, has, has toured the country, has it toured the world, and been told numerous times by many agents that I don't know where to fit her. And sometimes I feel like it's discrimination because of her gender, and sometimes because she's a female Black artist doing rock and roll. So, you know, I've done, you know, I do my due diligence. I don't really take no for an answer. That's just me, <laughs> you know, and yeah. we have, and we have a fan base. We have people that come to knock at the door, but it's interesting that the most love I've received is being from everywhere else, but our own backyard. It's um, a, when it comes to industry. So I, I just, that, that's my kind of my question. And I don't know if it's really a question, but I'd just love to hear any advice and thoughts that other people may have in dealing with these type of scenarios that, might be hitting you or hit me yeah <laughs> yeah and discrimination is it, like it comes in well, like there was a scenario with an australian artist over the like over the weekend being bumped from her stage for a for a band that was already having a having a show but they wanted another kind of warm-up show and she got bumped at the last minute as, as well to to another day and so there was an extra extra cost involved in that as well so discrimination is broad um and it's a great question to ask and i'm going to start with bring lady nade into the into the conversation from an artist point of view 
Um, it, it, I don't know how to frame a, an additional question around this, but from um, from your perspective, um, how do you feel about what what Click has brought up? Yeah, I feel there's two questions uh, that I'll try and answer. Hi, everyone. I'm Lady Nade. I'm black female. I um, got my hair in a in a sort of curly fro at the moment, I'm wearing red lipstick, and um, yeah, it's nice to be here. Um, so there's two questions I feel um, that David asked there. Uh, yeah, the first um, was um, how do we deal with discrimination and how do we create um, equality and um, diversity on billings is a big subject, especially in the UK where I am based at the moment and me and my manager discuss this a lot. We are fully aware that we're getting booked at the moment for this reason, um, more uh, that but with more uh, needs to be done to support diversity. And as a black female, a lot of more bookings are coming through to me because of this. Um, at the moment, we're not taking offense because I want to be part of the change for this to be normal but I'm still finding myself very often as the only non-white artist at the festival or venue, and also the only non-white um, female as well. So I feel that it would be great to see that being like, not feeling so, so much of a sort of tokenism. Um, and then the second uh, question, question I feel was um, how it, it was around communication really and how um, how the artists really much more prefer to be seen as the good um, <laughs> cop so um, protecting the artist from sudden changes like David mentioned like having to change the set time and that reduces stress. Um, if, if timings change or an agenda change, um, then the artist is gonna struggle to trust what the agreement is. And then that can financially eat into a budget if you're there for longer periods of time or you've been told a set time and then that changes, that could change uh, accommodation plans, um, finances to do with the uh, your musicians when you eat and when those deals start to change on the day problems occur and then that puts a stress on the artist and then that comes across to the promoter to the sound engineer and the artist is no longer seen as the good cop they now have to deal with the sort of negative energy and they'd much more prefer to just know what's happening in advance if there's no rider there's no rider and it's just really important to have clarity. And um, I, at times, have been given advancing information that has just changed on the day, and that that does bring a lot of stress um, on the artist. So yeah, working together to ensure sustainability and agendas and and plans are yeah transparent. Was a word that was used earlier. I think is a really good. Um, can, can, I, can I can I can I ask quickly? Is there anything wrong with taking full advantage of the fact now that, like, people are wanting do, do, like, uh, even if in in the bookers' heads they haven't been used booking diverse lineups for a, a long time, and they might, and it might be token. Is there anything wrong with you taking full advantage of that, and people who have been out of the out of the picture just coming up and saying, "I'm here, book me, let's go," and then, as yeah. you said, it, it just creates a it shows that it's, it can be done. Yeah, I think as David said, um, it's that then having to prove yourself as the artist in the genre when you then get booked. So um, I cross into folk and Americana and I'm often having to prove myself as a folk and American art, Americana artist. And at the moment, I'm not taking offense. I'm taking all of the opportunity because I want to be part of a change. I want to be part of normalizing, seeing more diversity on bills. But I'd also like to, <coughs> to, to be assured that it's not 
people aren't booking me because it's easy because they say oh you know we know Nate she's black will book her but they're also actively thinking uh, more than one black artist on a bill you know more than one black female artist on a bill and as I say at the moment I've yet to come across that happen so far yeah it's it's why it it is kind of wild that that is that can happen um I'm going to throw I'm going to put it out to the festivals now and get their uh get their response and throw a little additional question into the mix to kind of help is why do things get changed at the last minute as well? So if you could, if you just talk to the diversity question, I'm going to start, um, I might start with Liz um, on this one and um, yeah, speak to the diversity question and as to why things might change last minute. Um, why things might change last minute. Well, I guess, I, I guess for festivals generally for, you know, as opposed to setting up at a big theater where, where, um, you know, you've got the nice, you've got the nice venue and you don't have to worry about all the, the, um, you know, the weather, for example, I think festivals are used to, to changing things all the time. Everything's always up in the air. There's so much, there's so much that's uncertain. Um, all the time and I guess yeah I, I guess that kind of that's a it's a good question why do things change yeah I would hate I would hate to think that maybe you know a lot of us are doing that kind of thing that was was talked about as that click was talking about but um, yeah I think we're, we're just used to dealing with so much on the fly all the time and uh, I think that that maybe is part of it uh, not not the way that Click explained that particular situation, but there's so much always going. It's everything's a moving target at a festival the entire weekend. So, uh, I'm also just gonna like I'm gonna go to the next question is from is from Tao as well. So I'm gonna go to Tao in a second for her question. But is some of this pressure does it come from agents? Like, are you getting are you getting presented with diverse artists from the agent side of things, or are they pushing? are they like where's is there a disconnect there or is it disconnect in the in the festivals like not not recognizing the diversity still for me that yeah no that's that's great um no i would say the agents especially in the last few years that's that's changed that's changed and it's more at the forefront now so um and that and that all helps right because it makes us feel like you know, I think Lady Nade said she didn't want to be the only one there. It makes it feel normal. And so that we'll get to that that point. Yeah, no, it feels good. It has changed. Yeah. Maybe I can just comment, Glenn, uh, briefly. Um, Very briefly. Uh, just just re with regards to why things change at a festival, in my opinion, a lot of it is just poor planning. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Honestly, we've had artists over 25 years uh, recently who, you know, had a set at 8 p.m. and decided he's going to fly from New York at four, you know, out of LaGuardia. That, that's not a reasonable plan, you know. <laughs> and so it's not just on the artists. Sometimes it's on the festival. But I feel that often it's poor planning and it could be, be managers, artists or festivals. So I'm a big proponent yeah. in, look, don't let that happen. I feel like we, we. I feel like we uh, almost need a tour manager as uh, another person on, <laughs> on this on this discussion. Um, okay, I'm going to move to um, to Tao now and um, get you to ask your question. And if you wanted to slide, weigh in very quickly on what we've just discussed, go for it. But very quickly because we're quickly running out of time, and then ask your question. Yeah, for sure. So um, we're going to talk about radius, folks. Um, so question is, festival exclusivity clauses are often unduly restrictive, especially with touring costs for a larger band. How can we overcome this issue? Um, so first of all, some context is like um, large touring bands, not a lot of them can get out still on the road together in their perfect setup that they were playing with their members pre-pandemic. Um, a lot of people had to scale down to do solo sets, duo sets, trios. We're still getting all vaccinated, um, you know, so, but it, it, you know, if a, if a band is all vaccinated, they feel comfortable bringing a four or five piece out, traveling for four five hours on the road together. Um, I've been able to book some bands recently that have been able to do that. Um, but that affects, you know, cost and, and budgeting out 
who I can send out on the road. Um, radius clauses, I've mentioned this before earlier. I'm feeling that, um, and this is just my personal experience um, with my agency, that promoters are being a little more gentle and um, easy to work with, converse with, dialogue with on radiuses, given that everyone knows it's it's been hurting for artists. It's been hurting for everyone, but it, particularly how do we bring this band on the road now in, you know, the end of July, 2021 right now? Um, you know, I think there's great transparency um, you know, more transparency, I think that needs to happen from the artist, from the agent point of view, which is something I try to do. And not just about like talking about, hey, my band has three other things booked already um, in your local market, um, but we want to do the show with you as well. How do we do it? Um, I think talking about it earlier is best practice um, at the time of conversation hey, we have this, um, you know, um, after party that we booked for this festival at 11 p.m. But like a lot of my artists are DJs. So they do like live sets during the day and then DJ parties at night. And usually they get contracted for both. But like, how do we build that differently? How do we, how do we market this full band show um, in the afternoon at two o'clock different than this DJ's after party? So you know, the marketing question comes um, as a big piece in this uh, issue with Radius. So I'd love to hear um, festivals, promoters, what, what you what you have been doing, what your experience has been. Can I ask, quick, yeah. can I ask you a quick yes, no question? Mm -hmm. Is our Radius clauses in the current climate, like, fair? Like, should they just, like, should there be no, should we have a year off Radius clauses? Especially digital ones. Yeah, digital ones, I find. Um, so no. No. <laughs> um, and if, if they do have, if they do request, if promoters do request to have digital radiuses, like they're just, for me, my, my opinion is like, there should be good reason for that. Um, and then live radiuses. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I get the rationale behind it. And I, I always explain it to my artists because sometimes they don't get it. And then once I explain it to them, um, they they get it. Yeah, um, no, makes perfect sense. But we're in COVID times. The festivals could get closed down at any time. There's a want for people to get out and explore things. I, I, I think that a fair for festivals happening an hour away, that the the audience at the moment is quite quite possibly wanting to go to all of these different things. So I'm, that's just why I just wanted, to, from an agent perspective, yes or no, if, if we had a year off radius clauses across the board, or even six months, do you think that would be a good thing? Yes or no? Um, it'd be great for... Yes or no? Yes or no? Would it be a great thing? Um, yes, it would be a great thing. Um, <laughs> that's a lot of fun. That's a catchphrase. <laughs> I'm going to go, I'm going to go to Mark, and then I'm going to go to click on this one. So Mark, I think the radius clause issue is an interesting question. Uh, I think there has to be a reasonableness to it. Um, I think the challenge is that the festival world has changed in the last 10 years. And, and we, we've delved into this consolidation of major festivals. And what's happening is a lot of festivals are spending most of their money on the top three names. And, and then there's this wide divide between your headliners who are spending top dollar on and then the rest of the lineup. And now that's a challenge in many ways, but in the radius business, I agree in the top line. Okay. If you're paying seven figures for an artist, you don't want them playing within two hours of your market, but for all the other artists, I honestly think it doesn't matter. You have to be reasonable in terms of the play in the market. So you, you may not want an artist to play in the same market a few months prior. But I think afterwards is ridiculous. Let them play, <laughs> who cares once they've done the festival. So I think there has to be a more reasonable approach to it. And it doesn't have to be a blanket clause. It can apply to certain artists, your headliners versus the rest. And we all want everyone to be able to make a living. And what if the festival is sold out? Is, is, can there be a clause, a radius clause where if the festival sells out, then the radius clause is null and void? I think that's very reasonable. I, I would have no issue with that. Problem is, Please. most of us don't oh. sell out. <laughs> <laughs> well, selling out now could be half the half the capacity, and then it gets changed two days before, and you can sell more tickets. So yeah, it's very hard right now. Uh, click. 
I don't think there's anything else I can really add. I think what what everybody said here, I I would agree with actually, not in terms of you know, uh, softening up on Raiders causes, but I also can understand where festivals have, if they're booking a big name and that big name is the big one selling the ticket, they don't want that going, you know, somewhere around the corner at the same time. You know what I mean? It doesn't make sense. I totally get it. You know. Mama Keen, from an artist perspective. Um, yeah, really uh, feel aligned with what Mark said there as far as, you know, I really get the exclusivity and the radius clauses for those top three, four, five on the bill that are pulling in the audience, but for everybody else on the bill, which is probably 95% of the bill, um, I think it should matter less and I don't think a blanket clause across, across every artist at the festival, I think it needs to be a little bit more fluid and um, and again, enter into dialogue around how it's going to be packaged differently. I think, um, Tao, you spoke a little bit about the idea of kind of really having a conversation about going, well, this is how we're going to market this differently. This is how we're performing differently here. And this is how our fans are engaged in a different kind of engagement here. And rather, again, that, that ability to enter into dialogue and transparency and really represent how you are engaging differently rather than just being you know i think the, the age of being robotic around this is how we book this is how we're doing it this is how we deliver this is how we communicate to our fans it's it's, it's we've got a new opportunity and i think it's a great time to take it liz did you want to weigh in on this one now no i think there have been some fabulous answers and and it's made me also think when i when i sent out the offer um there is a, a part about radius in there, but I never once have really used it. So I'm wondering if I should just take that part out now. It, it actually says without without asking the artistic director, and I've always said yes to everybody. So it's kind of makes me wonder if I should even have it in there. Tao, I want to go back to you now and just kind of after hearing those answers, how does that work for you? 100%. Yeah. Like we're all chatting about this now. Um, we can't go back on this conversation. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's logical. It makes sense on so many fronts. And um, I think that more than ever, um, artists are understanding what agents do more. Artists are understanding the budgets behind festivals. Everything crashed this year. So everyone has to understand each other vantage points. Does that is it almost that's almost a silver lining amongst uh, this whole pandemic situation is that everybody has to start paying attention to the whole to the ecosystem a little bit more like what does my agent do and what is a radius clause and what what why really should probably be paying my manager more because they do a lot of work <laughs> yeah hopefully. Uh, okay yeah I, I, I. Uh, you know, yeah, it, I, I don't have anything more to add to that. Everything, you know. Mama Kim? Yeah, I just want to speak to the idea of like an ecosystem versus a competitive space. I think when you kind of start opening up this transparency and dialogue conversation in real terms, it's a massive risk because it's not how we've operated in the past. And it's easy to underestimate the artist's capacity for even holding that kind of information or, or that we have to kind of buffer all those things. But actually, I think when you start really thinking about us as an ecosystem who really cares about each other. I really want festivals to thrive. I really want my managers to be able to, to, to thrive. I really want booking agencies to thrive. And I really know that they all want the artists to thrive. But if we start actually behaving like that and change our behavior set accordingly, rather than keep inheriting what we have been, um, what we have inherited, I suppose, from, from previous models that weren't so inclusive, uh, but that's going to take a massive shift. However, massive shifts occur when s small ecosystems just start doing things differently. And um, it only takes a couple of festivals to start doing things differently and behaving differently with their artists and managers and agents for that word to get out really quickly because it's, you know, good spreads quickly, good news spreads quickly. And um, and I think new paradigms are uh, right for the taking, And it, but it's going to take a... a you know, a modicum of risk and uh, it's going to be a bit scary because it's going to be like, well, I'm not used to sharing this kind of my information and what if I get judged in here and what does it really mean for me? Um, but I do believe that's what it's going to take for it to be an ecosystem versus a, a truly competitive space. And within an ecosystem, I think there is room enough for all of us to be thriving. Um, I'm muting, I'm muting myself. <laughs> and we're, pro <laughs> we're probably also getting a, a more used to fear 
<laughs> as well. So taking a risk and, you know, trying something different for fear of failure is not, it's, you know, everything's scary at the moment. So why not just take that risk and, and see if it can work? I'm going to stick with the, the artist here and I'm going to ask uh, uh, Lady Naid to uh, put the artist question forward. Yeah, please. happy to. Happy to indeed. So, yeah, my question is, once the deal is done, is there any room to move or change it? And um, I guess, uh, to give some context to that, I guess what I was saying maybe earlier is that once a deal is in place and then it starts to change, um, it, there can be sort of pros and, and cons to that because if I've been booked as a solo act and then something changes and I can bring my band then that's really cool um, or if there is a radius and suddenly I can gig somewhere else and that's great they're great changes and then on the other hand if a deal's been done and a time's been set and then the time changes it might not be so good or if a rider has been um, set and then suddenly there is no rider that can be no good too so yeah once a deal is done um, is there any room to move or change it I might start with Mark on this one please um, so Lady Nina I'm not sure I completely understand but but on the one hand you mentioned you know there was a rider and there's not a rider to me that's not a fair change you know, like whatever was agreed to should be delivered. Um, but I do think that this is all about communication. And, and the problem is that as a promoter or as the festival producer, we're generally communicating with an agent. We're not actually talking to the artist. And we have to be able to communicate to the agent what, what we're talking about. And the agent has to communicate what the artist's wishes are. And I'm always looking for a context because too many times we deal with so many agents and we're saying, well, how much does this artist cost? There's no context to it. The artist is playing with a band or they're playing solo or they've just had a, a huge breakthrough uh, record. Uh, this is what we're looking for. And too often that context isn't there. And I think that we're always open when an agent or an artist or a manager comes and says, look, Things have changed. We have, we've had artists that said, look, we've now got a great opportunity to go and play this other tour. We've been booked to open for such and such. And often we say, that's amazing. I mean, you know, we're, we're happy to let the artists do that and have them play next year. And it's like all about communication and a willingness to compromise and be reasonable. Well, yeah, Mama Kent was gonna throw to you. Um, I think um, just for some further context on this, um, I've just seen the first couple of deals come through for festivals for me where, so just a bit of um, context, I sort of play multiple different lineups and one of the lineups I do is a duo where we engage a choir, a local choir to play with us who then rehearses for six weeks, blah, blah, blah. Um, now the issue for us in Australia is my band member lives on the east coast. I live on the on the west coast, and there's major border restrictions. So the, as far as like things changing, we, there, there couldn't be more variables um, that could change. But I'm just seeing the first few deals coming that are, are actually like scenario A looks like this, scenario B looks like this, scenario C looks like this, and and it it it's, it was it was great. It was great to see that rather than. Um, rather than going, you either deliver or you don't. Um, it basically went, you know, at around the three week mark out of the event, let's make a decision about this. Let's make a decision about this, depending on the variables there. And also uh, as financially speaking, um, as an artist having flexibility around there being no deposit, but there being some allow there being an allowance in cancellation for um, any expenses that we've incurred in the, in the, in the lead in if the, if the gig was to get cancelled. So those dialogues are starting to open up. 
Um, so as far as the moving and changing, I am starting to see the first sort of peaks of going, what are the variables you are dealing with artist? And as my agent going forward to festivals going, these are the variables my artist is dealing with. How can we, how can we tier an offer accordingly? So I think that's quite pretty exciting to start seeing that. I'm not sure that we're quite fully there yet, but um, certainly starting to see the first musings of it. Click, can I get your perspective? Oh. Yeah, um, funny enough, that actually happened to me this year uh, where I had to kind of go back and the deal was almost already kind of signed, still delivered. It wasn't signed off, but um, <clears throat> it changed mainly because the artist had some concerns at the, you know, at the last minute. You know, I, I wanted to get out there and start doing things and kind of just jumped. And we were like, okay, well, let's do it. And then kind of, you know, came back to listen. Like, I, I don't think I could do it at what the price is because I have a band and I have all these, you know, rehearsals and all these things to, to, to make this work. But um, it was what was dope. And this comes back again to like what Mark was saying is like communication. Like when I went back to the, uh, the promoter and said, you know, we have some concerns. I know we've gone down a lot of conversations about the money, but like, I really need to go. I, I don't think I could do this out more. And um, what was dope was that they, they really wanted to like hear why, like they're like, okay, what, what is it that you need? Like, how can we make this work? And that, that transparency was beautiful. Like I really, like I haven't experienced that with a lot of people that actually showed a genuine, like, I really want to make this work. Like, just tell me why. And when we told them why they, it was like, Oh, no problem. Let's do it. Do you know what I mean? I was like, okay, damn. It was like, I didn't expect all that, you know, but um yeah, I, I think the communication and just, I would encourage other artists and I would encourage other managers to not be scared to like, you know, just say what it is that you need, <laughs> you know? And, and I would encourage promoters and I would encourage uh, agents and I would encourage um, uh, to, to listen <laughs> and, and to also communicate what, why you can't do that. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you can't do something, this is why we can't do that. You know, um, it, it just helps in like making us all, like you said, Mama Kin, having a stronger sense of belonging to each other and like responsibilities and care for one another. You know what I mean? Which I, I really like. Is it, is there an, I mean, I don't know whether, whether this, I'm sure there's a lot of artists and there's a lot of artist teams around there, but the idea of, of getting to getting together to communicate i get what, what am i trying to ask you it is in the in the past has everybody just lent on the person to just get on and do their job that's your responsibility that's your responsibility responsibility and the sense of understanding what that person is actually doing has kind of been lost it's just like well that's what you do so you just take care of it so do we need to come back to like like people having weekly meetings with their whole team to kind of go right where are we at this and it's you know and the artist is able to explain where that where they're at and uh the manager is able to explain to everybody where what what's happening in the whole bigger picture like those kind of things is that does that need to happen more i'll go to you will get click i'll get you to to it, answer it, it, then i'll go to nate quickly <laughs> i'll go to tao it does and i think like due to the sense of the world we've been in there's a lot more compassion amongst each other I just hope that like capitalism doesn't come back into the mix that changes everybody's thought pattern again. You know what I mean? Because that's, you know, I, I'll never forget pissing off a certain agent because um, my artist did not want to do the tour. And um, because we just didn't feel like it was the right fit. Like we felt like this artist was not, you know, it was a huge arena tour opportunity to be in front of a lot of people. <laughs> But the artist, and it was already signed, like it was all signed off, ready to go. I guess the agent had done all the all the the ends and outs of kind of lining it up and just assumed that we would be all gun ho for it. And we were just like, nah, that's not really our vibe. Like that's just not where we want to fit. And I think that there was this underlining like upset, you know, a, a type of thing. And I think that could have all changed with what you're talking about like that kind of transparency of like understanding where each individual is trying to go without just jumping to conclusions or something. Do you know what I'm saying? 
Sorry, yeah, it's been yeah. a long day. <laughs> <laughs> Nate, what, what, I'm going to come back to you and just and, and get some some comments about everything that's just been said. Yeah, um, I think um, yeah, I agree with what Mark said initially uh, to the response, which is yeah, if you're not if you're in agreement with stuff and then you're not getting it, it is unfair. And then um, what um, I think Liz said about um, just um, the who the responsibility is on. And I think as an artist, and someone said, if because we've got our job roles, I think sometimes, so I don't, to not go too far into it, but a situation that happened is that um, a gig's booked I'm lucky to have a team now, so a gig gets booked from my uh, agent and my agent sends me the information. And then you turn up as an artist and because of COVID and, and distance and stuff, sometimes your manager is not always there. And so if that deal is not there, again, as an artist, you're, you feel that your job role isn't to deal right there and then with what's agreed and what's not there or what is there, but actually the show and and performing and not coming across as the manager or the agent because it's that yeah that fear that you're going to be seen not doing the job that you're there for whereas if it was more transparent and like I was more able to sort of ask these questions and and not feel that that would put me in a position that I would be seen as well that's that you know that artist is being a bit of a diva but actually just actually really just <laughs> getting what the the deal has been agreed and then that transparency would like really help <laughs> yeah and you, you want to turn up to a, like you can't go like managers you know there's a whole bunch of people probably listening to this who are self-managed artists as well and it's going to be very different for them to have to flick from left right brain to right brain and if you have a team and then you're certain then you are putting responsibility on the rest of your team because they're getting a percentage of your of what you make to do a job and then you turn up you want to be able to turn up and just be an artist right it's very hard to then have to renegotiate your deal on the spot for some particular reason. Um, I'm going to go quickly go to Liz and then I'm going to go to Tao and I think we'll, then we'll be like one minute Liz and then one minute Tao and I think that then we'll be done. Well, I, I can only speak for myself, but I would love to um, to to speak to artists um, before the festival, like not not the week before probably, but you know the months before that. Um, just to be able to communicate and get things clear with them, because sometimes I, I'm never sure if all the information that I want to say and the whole passing on um, all the all the thoughts and the vibe of the festival and what I expect from them and what they can expect when they get there. I'm never really sure if it gets to them. So, you know, I, I don't I, like I said, I can't speak for everybody, but I'd love to speak to more of the artists. And maybe it's something I could just say to the agent, you know, can you put me in touch with you know, that, that, that artist, because I'd love to talk to them. Maybe it's that simple. Maybe they need the invitation. I hadn't really thought much about it. We're pretty used to Zoom these days. So hard to get everybody on a Zoom there, yeah. Just to jump in, it's funny that you said that, Liz, because I did have recently um, someone from a festival contact me, the, 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 uh, the, the manager of the, the festival, and just say, hey, really looking forward to having you here. Let me know if there's anything you need. Uh, when you arrive and I thought that was just a really nice touch to open that communication if I did then need to speak to someone because this particular festival there was no signal so even if I wanted to reach out to my manager or someone else I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah when technology goes down then you're really in trouble. Yeah. Um, uh, Tao did you want to add to anything this, to this conversation or just give us some final thoughts from you and then we'll go around everyone for some quick like 30 second last minute comment. Um, no just last last comment is just um, you know we've talked about being um, communicative transparent. Um, I also just want to um, make a comment on flexibility like we all have to be so flexible like I just did a show Last week, live taping um, just in Guelph, um, an hour west of Toronto, Canada, and literally, you know, when we talk about being um, understanding of the other person's position, you know, as an agent, you know, our bunch is notorious for <laughs> not being the friendliest bunch and, and just kind of like a blanket, don't talk to me unless you have an offer sheet ready for my artist type of thing from promoters. Like it doesn't work like that anymore. The show that we did last week was kind of like, I want to book your act. I want to do the five piece, 
but I'm still waiting to hear from my grant money. And like, literally we did it in five days of just bringing this five piece band for a six hour drive on, on, on five or six days notice. And we made it happen because I was able to be flexible. And he was like, please be flexible with me. As I hear from my grant money, I can pull the trigger in, in 48 hours, but I can't let you know until that time. Um, so I think there's this understanding of the other perspective of, you know, this guy really wants to bring my band to their festival, but literally he, his hands are tied until he hears from his budget. So, you know, um, I think just being flexible to know that other people are under other pressures besides artists and, um, and, and just, you know, if we can make it happen, we will. Um, I think just being flexible with that, you know, me checking in with my artist, Hey, you know, July 25th, it is bookmarked. Just, I'm, we're checking in every day with the promoter, just please hold the date. Um, if we can make it happen, we will. And we did, and it was yeah. just gorgeous. Experience, so, yeah. so the good thing we, we are out of time and we're about to get cut off. Um, so I'm conscious of that and sorry, we couldn't go around for last minute thoughts, but there will be a a uh, mark two of this um, on September 1st at 5 p.m. Central Time. Um, but to cut, the, the key words that came up multiple times here was transparency, communication, and flexibility. They were, they were the, the three that came up the most in this conversation. So I'm sure that within um, the second round of, of this discussion that those um, they will come up again. Um, thank I you. Would, I'm going to jump in, Glenn. I'm going to thank, thank you. I'm going to thank you. Thank yous. I'm going to thank you, Glenn, for being transparent and flexible, and but also thank all of our wonderful panelists and honor their time commitment to this webinar. Thank you, Lady Nade, Mama Kin, Click, Liz, Tao, Mark, especially those of you who have never participated in a Folk Alliance international event before. We really appreciate you being here today, as does our audience, very engaged audience. Um, thank you to everybody. This recording will be up in within 48 to 72 hours on our YouTube channel, free for everyone in the world to see. And speaking of which, we provide these webinars and these conversations um, as an offering to uh, the global music community at large. So if you would like to support the work that Folk Alliance is doing, we invite you to consider becoming one of our donors at folk.org backslash donate. In the meantime, stay kind, everyone, and connected to each other, and we shall see you all another time. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Nicole. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. That was really quick. <laughs> Bye, everyone.